this is our problem solving panel. And we've got Natalia, Jennifer, Geraldine, and Jessica. Can you guys come on down? And while they're coming, let me clarify about the NASA logo. You know I was going to do this. So we want you to, I would love to see pictures of the NASA logo G-rated, because they're government, so government G-rated. So let's just be clear about that. Um, so we'd love to see you guys um, with the NASA logo and sharing, because that's what it's all about. We're, we're sharing the NASA logo. When you do your logo, you, what, we, what we can't do is say, like, NASA paid for your, like, if, if you create a product, product, you can't say, like, NASA endorsed my product or something like that. But to have your project, NASA did bring you together for this project. So sure, put NASA logos in there. It's just not, NASA's not paying you. NASA's not, you know what I mean? So. Be thoughtful about how you use it, but we want you to use it um, because that's why you're here and you're all here because NASA gave us the opportunity to give you an opportunity and let's you know, keep spreading the love. So this is our problem solving panel and what's so exciting about this is um, we really started this whole project. I, I bit off too much for this project. I really wanted to start a project on how women problem solve uniquely, which should be the sharing economy of how women problem solve because I think that we're worth more when we're on a team. So we started off with that, you know, how do we, women problem solve differently, so how can we make that, you know, something that everyone needs a, a woman who's problem solver on their team in order to win. That's how we started. It was too big. So now we pull it back down to you, how can we get women to the data table and more people here, but we do want to talk about problem solving and how is that different and how is it okay just because I think differently doesn't make it wrong. It's just I think differently, so I'm gonna come at a problem sideways and upside down. People look at me crazy, but it's, it's different. It's not wrong. So we want to promote that and, and <coughs> take it away, guys. Good morning. Um, my name is Jessica Klein. I'm a designer by day and a civic activist by night. <laughs> um, I work at the Mozilla Foundation. I'm a software designer. Um, I make tools to basically teach people how to learn about the web, make the web, and break the web. Um, and so you can check out some of the things I need if you go to like webmaker.org or um, coming soon is going to be teach.mozilla.org. So you should check that out. Um, so. I guess I was invited here not because of my day job. I probably was invited here to talk because of something that happened to me a few years ago. And it happened right here in New York. I um, was watching the news, like everybody else, during Hurricane Sandy, except that my parents, who are crazy, as all parents are, they decided to stay in their house, our house in Rockaway Beach, um, through the storm. And not because they're like these crazy, um, storm watcher type people that you see on TV. They're not like that. They're just like normal New Yorkers who just don't believe the president when the president's on the television saying everyone should leave New York. <laughs> but despite that, my parents did not leave their house. And so during the storm, I was watching New York One and I was watching the news and all of a sudden they're saying, oh yeah, and Rockaway is on fire. And then it, like all my power blacked out. And so I didn't have any connection with my parents for like, 72 hours or something like that. Um, and so like any, um, any of us would do, I was like scrambling trying to figure out how I can get information on my parents, how I could um, make sure that my family was okay, my town was okay, my friends were okay. Um, and so I went to Twitter and I just started tweeting out anything I could, hashtag Rockaway, hashtag Hurricane Sandy, hashtag help, help, help. And I connected with a bunch of women mostly, um, who were also outside of Rockaway, probably in Brooklyn or around New York area, but not directly hit by the storm. And they, we basically guided each other, gave each other guide, um, you know, information. We were exchanging back and forth, anything we could to figure out how we could get back to Rockaway. And so then what I did, which I kind of don't recommend doing, um, is I took a zip car and ignored the news and police reports that told you not to go back to Rockaway and I went and drove um, and forced my boyfriend at the time to drive in the car with me um, over Rockaway and I was the whole time tweeting with people checking like 
is this safe to go over the bridge? There's no toll person on the bridge. Is this okay? Like, can we go to this, this traffic light? It's dangling. Um, those sorts of things. And eventually we made it to my parents. And when I got to their house, I walked up the steps. And it was like one step, two step. And I was like, my heart was pounding. And I was watching all the trees. It was very picturesque and some sort of horror film. And um, I opened the door, and it was like that scene in Jumanji when you open the door and all of the water comes flooding out at you. Um, and my parents were at the, it was like a two-story house, and they were on the second floor because the entire um, first floor was flooded. You know, basically the basement all the way to first floor, it was something like 10 feet. Um, because Rockaway is on this peninsula, so there's water on both sides. So if you can imagine, like, my house was here, and water was here, and here, and this is a beautiful point at my a parents' house where they all connected. Um, and it freaked me out, and I immediately tried to figure out how I could help my parents. Not only did I have to, you know, they were fine and safe, and thank goodness, but, you know, their house had to be... Um, removed of water, there was all this damage to their property, they had no electricity, no way to contact. When I drove my mother outside of the area, which to, honestly, that might have been the biggest deal of this entire thing because as a New Yorker who drives, like I don't drive, never, I just take the subway. <laughs> um, my mother had no idea that it was like this big superstorm. She just thought, oh, it was like this bad thing that happened on her block. And so when I drove outside of Rockaway and she saw that there were blocks that were completely burned down, that there were houses damaged, that people couldn't find each other. She was just like in the state of, like she didn't know what to do. She was like looking up in the air. She was really look, and my mother is like this competent, you know, she knows how to use the web. She taught me how to make a website. She's kind of like, you know, a go-getter. And so it was really shocking for me to see my parents so distraught. And um, when I got back home, I just was feeling really unsettled and so, I kept going every day to help um, my parents. It's called demucking, when you shovel anything like sewage out of your house or um, you know, really to get out all of the mold so that you don't get any sort of um, serious health issues. And also you want to maintain like all of my childhood photographs were gone and you know, all those sorts of things. Um, but I was really concerned about other people in the neighborhood, in the area, and I was thinking, if this happens to me, the other people must also be missing their relatives. And so I went online and I went to the church in the town um, in Rockway, which still had no power and everything. And so I was just going there and I, people were coming up to me and handing me papers, asking me for, to check on different people. Um, and I started to form a group with a lot of different friends there, um, newly made friends over the internets. And it was, um, it was just like overwhelming and too much. And so I started to make a database at the time. And then um, I would basically work <laughs> with, um, I like by day would go to Rockaway, stand in front of the church, get help, go out and give the help, do, you know, try to find a person. And then I go back home and then I would put it into a database, anything I didn't get to and any requests that other people made. And then I would try to create a, um, kind of like assignments for volunteers. And I just wrote up on Twitter, Lundy, like I need some volunteers, you know, my small town, blah, blah, blah. And like the next day, something like a thousand people showed up. And I was like, I don't know how to handle a thousand people. <laughs> I'm just this girl from Rockaway and I care, but oh my God. And so um, what it turns out that there are lots of people who are really good at, um, mobilizing and community organization. Apparently these people called the US military are pretty good at that. And they were there and FEMA was there and this other organization called Team Rubicon was there. Um, and they are pretty amazing because they are vets who um, kind of organize natural disaster, after natural disasters and de deploy. And so we worked with them and basically we shared the data and people were only really coming to us, to me and to my friends because we were locals and we were trusted. And so, it really helped the whole process because we were on the ground and we knew what the problems were and we were able to target and we were able to go over to our Aunt Mary's house or our friend Joe's house and check on them. And I think one of the most um, overwhelmingly and memorable nights of my life was when I was on Facebook and somebody couldn't find their um, relative who was very old, didn't speak English and was in um, NYCHA, the housing projects, which had no power and electricity. And 
I basically worked with a network of people all through Facebook online to find someone who could speak Spanish, drive a car at 9 o'clock at night, get to the person, um, and check if she was alive. And they found her, but she was um, in really bad health, and um, all of the hospitals were closed that night. And so basically, we, through my network of now new friends and now new volunteers over Twitter, Facebook, um, you know, the web and the tech community, frankly, um, we were able to get this woman to a hospital like a few towns over and then really be able to um, get her the help she needs, connect her with her family, and at the end of the day, she's fine and well and perfectly healthy and living her life now. But that was, a, it was super scary. And um, after the storm, it, as Katie was saying earlier, it doesn't just stop after like the main event, after a hackathon or after a crisis like that. It just keeps going and evolving and you become this point person in your community for whatever cause you're championing. And so um, after the storm, there was like immediate response work and I had to get out and I had to make those databases and I had to figure out a way to help people find their families and get their houses demuffed and um, back in shape. But then immediately after that, there became um, this larger issue of how to get people to kind of get to this place where they can just live their day-to-day -day lives um, in this new community that now has been kind of devastated by the storm. And then after that, there was kind of this other level of like where we are today, of like how are we gonna rebuild this community in a resilient way so that when a storm happens again in New York, because we know it's gonna happen again, how are we gonna be prepared and ready to handle it? And how are we gonna rebuild in a way that isn't just rebuilding, it's rethinking how we're building. And so what I did was I became involved in a bunch of hackathons. Um, coincidentally, I, there was the first day, um, National Day of Civic Hacking, and I noticed it and I thought it was a great way to, you know, kind of get hackers and get people who are interested in problem solving and solutions and technology to Rockway, which is kind of like, there's New York and then there's Rockaway, because like, it's kind of just like on the outskirts, it's like two A trains away, um, and it's hard to get people to come there, and I didn't know if anyone would know it. And I, so I publicized the event through the National Day of Civic Hacking. I worked with the local public schools to host the event, and I um, and then, you know, like recruited as many people as I could to participate in the event. But as I was like doing this, I was noticing that there was this major problem happening in Rockaway, which was that lots of people were coming in to kind of solve problems for the community, but the community had no voice in that conversation. They were just being told, oh, we're gonna come in and we're gonna fix these seat streets for you, we're gonna put the um, Wi-Fi units, we're gonna put them all the way, you know, 10 blocks away from where all the houses are. There were a lot of things going on, and the residents really wanted to have a voice in the conversation. So I felt like this was a good point for us to really insert ourselves. And so what I did is ran, I ran a bunch of um, workshops, kind of like this today, um, where I worked with locals. And so I basically ran, um, invited everyone kind of down to the boardwalk. It was a pretty cool, just chill session. It, students came, children came, senior citizens came. And I think that was like probably the reason that we actually had a successful hackathon later on, it was because we worked together to identify problems. Um, and so after that, we had the hackathon, we came up with several solutions, and to this day, we're all working together as this community of problem solvers and design thinkers to keep rethinking how we can build resiliently. Um, so it was a really powerful experience, but I just wanted to point out that there were three major moments of problem solving in this like crazy arc of my life after the hurricane. <laughs> It was during the storm, um, and we really had to, I mean, I just want to take a step back and say that the most important part of designing solutions is clearly identifying the problem or the opportunity. And that's really also the hardest thing to any design problem. You'll sit there today and you're gonna be like, what is the actual problem I'm designing for? Like, domestic violence, such a huge topic. Like, where's the part that I can dig into? Um, and so, Problem solving happened during the storm, as I was talking about. You know, there was this constant back and forth of how to connect with my friends, how to connect with family, um, how might I learn more about how bad the storm was, um, and how was it impacting my family. Then, 
immediately after the storm when I was driving to my parents' house, you know, I then had more questions of how was my family, how, to get, how was I going to get to my family, how to help my family get to safety, and how to help other families get to safety. You know, it was just like I was constantly asking questions. And I think that's part of problem identification is really figuring out what the question is and how you're going to frame it so that you can frame your answer. And then in the aftermath of the storm, it was how can we rebuild in a resilient manner? How might we include residents and locals in the decision-making process um, for rebuilding? And finally, you know, it was like, how is it possible um, to thrive in New York knowing that this very well could happen again? And I think the formulation of these questions was part of the process. It was getting people in the community to articulate that this was the problem that they were trying to solve. Um, and in every situation here, I use my skills as a open source designer and frankly, as a citizen of New York <laughs> to find solutions. Um, you know, there is this sort of process I went through of identifying the problem, figuring out what data I needed to help me solve this problem, um, and recognizing what I could do and what um, needed to be delegated. And that's kind of a... I, I was spoken about earlier, but it's a real key issue here of just understanding, um, just understanding what you're good at and what other people are good at around you. And you don't have to feel like you need the rel to reinvent the wheel, um, that there are many ways that you can be an innovative problem solver within existing frameworks. And if those frameworks um, aren't useful to you, at least acknowledge what the frameworks are so that you can break them and make them um, useful to yourself. Um, I guess ultimately, you know, design is this verb, and, and verbs can, are connectors that um, support great nouns, you know, people, places, and things. And I think that's what you're here to do, to support great nouns. Um, so good luck today, and if you know, I know we're not asking questions, but if you want to tweet me, I'm, I am Jess Klein. <laughs> Thanks. Hello, everyone. Um, so my name is Geraldine Rodriguez. Uh, I am the co-founder of The Knowledge House, and at The Knowledge House, we provide tech entrepreneurship training to young adults from low-income communities, and we started this work in the Bronx. Um, I'm happy that you mentioned community organizers because my background is actually in community organizing and digital media making. And being a community organizer is very important, especially when it comes to solving problems. Uh, I started the Knowledge House because for a very long time as an organizer and also as an educator, I thought, how can we lift low-income communities out of poverty? And I always found we're not actually asking the people that live in these communities how to problem solve. And so after college, I started this in the Bronx. I really wanted to ask the youth, the uh, people in government, the parents, the seniors, um, what do they think needs to change? And so at the Knowledge House, what we've done is we have provided tech entrepreneurship programming with a focus on problem solving um, when it comes to community issues. Uh, so our program is a three-month program. They learn a bunch of tech skills from 3D printing. Uh, they learn about lean startup methodology, uh, digital media, coding skills and they build a tech product as their final project that will solve a community problem. And so for us, we see this big picture as, okay, we're gonna use technology for social good, and we're going to try to alleviate poverty. We might not see it really happen within our generation, but we wanna at least leave uh, like footsteps for people behind us to follow. Um, and it's great because through our program, we have young people solving various problems, right? So when you problem solve, you can always break up a big problem into small little problems. And poverty is a huge problem, right? So when we bring our young people to the table, they are faced with everyday issues that they themselves want to tackle, they, they want to talk about it, um, and it really helps us. Uh, in terms of, for example, unemployment, you can always dig deeper into the problem by asking why. Why are young adults unemployed? Well, maybe because they're lacking job skills. Why are they lacking job skills? Well, because maybe they're not getting an equal opportunity to be in a great school, on and on and on, right? Um, when you open it up, you actually get to know um, the young person's perspective. Why are, are we living in poverty? They bring up issues like food deserts, teen pregnancy, gang violence. 
Um, and it's been great. So we recently had a hackathon in January. Uh, we partnered with a community-based organization and they actually specialize uh, in youth activism. So it was like, we brought in the tech side, they already focused on the community activism. We were able to build a learning environment where people really focused on solving issues in the Bronx. They taught each other tech skills and they had an open conversation about issues. Um, what was great also is that a lot of these hackers weren't from the Bronx, but they were still super open to solving local issues. And it was very refreshing to know, okay, even though we want to target people that live in the community so that we can hear their voice, um, other people care about these issues too. And so all of these different perspectives, um, out of this experience came about 11 projects. Um, someone built an app to facilitate people that were homeless. Uh, someone built an app to create more food options because in the Bronx it's a food desert, et cetera, et cetera. And so, I suggest uh, to all of you, when you're thinking about problem solving, think about the data, but also think about people, right? Data isn't only about researching and looking at graphs. Data includes your personal experiences and also testimonials from other people. Um, also, going back to breaking down the big problem into smaller problems, you need to learn what problem you're best suited to solve. Right? Um, poverty is huge. Um, maybe you can focus on making sure that people don't go hungry versus alleviating poverty, right? Um, so just think about these things. And if you have any questions, feel free to come grab me later. Thank you. My timer here in case <laughs> you're over. So hi, uh, my name is Natalia Arguello. I'm the director of New York Designs. We are the incubator for design and tech companies in New York. And uh, I'm also a, desi I'm a, I'm a designer by training. I went to design school for um, almost five years. We had like a very, uh, it, I was uh, the part of the first class of this university that was just starting a design uh, degree. And it was a great experience because every single thing we did was about solving problems, right? And uh, when I went to design school, my parents, I don't know that they understood why I wanted to go to design school. My mom kept saying, oh, you should go to business school. Like since I was in, I don't know, fifth year, uh, fifth grade or something. And um, so all my life I went uh, on saying, yeah, I'm gonna go to business school, but one day, I, I met a designer and I thought that it was great what she was doing and I really got interested in the topic. And uh, yeah, so when I got to design school, I think that I felt that I had, I had to show uh, my parents and my family, um, you know, why I was doing what I was doing. And I started working on projects that I was really interested about, always in the, this intersection between uh, design and education. That was my topic. I really uh, enjoyed um, talking about that and, and developing my projects about that. But um, as a designer, you can really work on anything. Everything is a problem that you can that you can solve. So I also went to Parsons Design and Technology uh, degree. I graduated from the MFADT uh, program, and that gave me an understanding of what technology is. So now I was like, "Ooh, new problems." Right, I, I was ready to, um, you know, to take on different kind of projects, projects that I have, that I have not uh, thought about before. So that was very, very exciting as well. But then I started, um, after graduating from Parsons, it was a really bad time here in New York, there were no jobs, and uh, I was hired to do market research for this incubator, New York Designs that we were starting and uh, I thought, well, this is a design, I, I really didn't want to do market research at the time. I really wanted to you know, do interactive um, websites for kids to learn how to do something. And, uh, but I took this challenge and I was like, okay, I'm gonna take it like, and I'm gonna use everything I know as a designer to, um, to solve this, this problem. And, uh, 
Yeah, so when I started at New York Designs, I really uh, was looking at um, entrepreneurship and designers and what were the, the challenges that they found um, uh, starting or um, building companies or growing companies. So, uh, from, but, but I'm gonna use that example just to show one way of solving problems. You know, it's called design thinking. Um, you know, it's only one way. Every designer has a different way, and I actually have an adaptation of many different ways that I have learned through school. So after all these amazing stories, I'm gonna tell you a little bit of the technical aspect of uh, behind the, the scenes of solving problems. So um, can you help me with the... Oh, great. Yeah, okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay, so um, design thinking was made popular, but one of the um, design um, very, uh, I mean, by very smart people in this design a company that is called IDO. And uh, they started talking about this process of solving problems, and uh, they actually have a book about it. You, um, actually, I can, I can give the name, I, I don't remember right now, but I can give you the name. It is a very easy re read, and it is gonna tell you a lot of the strategies that um, many designers use to solve problems. And it doesn't matter if the problem that you're, you're solving, if it's a service, if it's an app, if it's a website, if it's uh, a product, um, it, it's good for everything. Um, I think that it translates to everything, so. Change by design, yes, yes. Okay, so. Okay, so it's a little. I don't want to stop. No, stop. Go back. <laughs> back. <laughs> okay, it's a little small, but uh, design thinking has these three stages. Excellent, thank you. Uh, and the three stages are motivation, ideation, and implementation. I'm not going to go technical on you, I'm going to tell the story of how it goes um, from here. So ideation is what we have been talking about. It's really finding, can you change to, yes. So it's really identifying what is the problem or the opportunity that you're gonna solve. And you do that, as, as you said, by asking questions. Who are you going to, uh, who is included in this problem, right? Who do you want to help? Where are them? What kind of uh, activities they do? All the questions that you can ask about that specific audience. Um, I usually uh, work with um, people that are new to design and they want to solve, you know, to design something for everyone or to build a company for everyone. And that is, you know, that is a way of doing uh, things or designing things, but only if you have someone in mind. And actually, uh, sometimes designers, what they do is they think about, you know, uh, Francesca, who is a girl that, has fi that is 15 years old and lives in New York. And then they start extracting a lot of information about that specific person. So it's not even, you know, girls, teenage girls. No, it's it becomes very specific. And then you can think about all these new questions that you can ask about the, the, the people that you're going to serve. And part also uh, of um, understanding what the problem or the opportunity you have is to think about how much, how many resources you have to develop this idea. So it's not always only about money, it's also about time. How much time is it gonna take you to develop this? Is, is there any other resource that you will need to, to use to solve the problem, right? Because sometimes we're so excited about the idea that we don't think that we're gonna have a team of three, right? That. Um, that need to code with you, or that need to design something, or that need to go out and talk to people. Okay, the second, thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so that is motivation. What is motivating you to solve the problem? The second one is once you have this problem defined, um, is really ideation. You come up with ideas. And you know, at the beginning of a project, you're gonna come up with 10 ideas, 100 ideas, 1,000 ideas. And the only way to know which one is the right one, uh, what usually happens when you're working with a team is that people get a little bit in love with their own ideas. 
and, and then they cannot see beyond that, right? And uh, sometimes it's difficult to get, uh, you know, objective opinions because people get in love with their ideas. As, a desi as designers, we're trained not to get in love with our ideas. Usually we go to, in design school, you go present and you get all this criticism and you feel like you failed and you feel terrible because you think that your idea, you are your idea and you are not your idea. Your idea is, is something that you created and you create a thousand of them. So don't get, yes, <laughs> don't get attached to, I, I, I have been there. You know, I, I worked for a long time as a graphic designer, and every time a client told me, oh, this is too small, this is too small. My text in my presentation right now, I'm seeing it, it's too small. <laughs> or they said, oh, no, you know what, I don't like blue. Or no, 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 I don't like yellow, I like blue. You want to say, you want to, you want to say, no, you hire me because I'm a designer, I know what, what are the right colors, but you have to learn to just listen to your client or to your audience, right? Um, and, and just respond to what they are saying. The most important thing about evaluating what ideas are good and what ideas are not that good is talking to people. Talk to people. As soon as you have an idea, don't spend a lot of time developing the idea because once you invest in that idea, let's say you spend like 10 hours coding something, and, you, and then you go talk to people, then you're invested. You know, you don't want to waste what you already had put into that idea. So the sooner you can test without spending much time, do it in, with paper, with whatever, whatever you have around you. Try to, to test it, to prototype it, talk to people, get feedback. People are gonna, people, the, the, there's something else that you have to, to know about people. Uh, that is interesting is that people are going to tell you things. You shouldn't believe what they say. You should see what they do. Okay? So let me explain. When we started New York Designs, we knew that designers didn't have, when, when we go to school, we don't get business training, right? So you don't have the business skills to go negotiate a contract. You don't know how to write a business plan. You don't know how to project your, you know, do your financial projections for the next three years. You don't know these things. We knew that. The people that we wanted to serve knew that too. So we were like, oh, wouldn't it be good if we offer some business classes for designers? And everyone said, yes, that is what I need. Because they thought that is, you know, the right way of learning something they didn't know. So we develop all this curriculum of business classes, to hire people, you know, spend so much time really thinking about this curriculum. And then when we offer the classes, a lot of the designers didn't take them. They were like, well, I don't have time. So they said, and they knew that taking a class, like a marketing class, was the right thing to do for them to grow their business. But, they're, but they, what they do is, it's different than what they said. And I'm not saying that that is wrong, that we are, a human, as human beings, we're like that, right? We say what we think is the ideal me, right? The ideal me would be eating organic food every single day, <laughs> or healthy food, not organic, healthy food, you know? But that is the ideal I have of me. What I do, actually, is that sometimes I don't have time and I have to run down the stairs, get something in the deli and come back up, right? So see what people do, okay? Listen to what they say too, but seeing what they do is more important than anything else. Putting your, yourself in, in someone's shoes, right? So when, when you're talking to that 15-year-old girl, who lives in New York and maybe lives in the Bronx or maybe lives in Queens or in Manhattan, try to think like that girl. And it's not easy. You have to be among those people. So go there and talk to your people and see what they really need. What you were saying, uh, a lot of times designer, uh, or designers or developers um, you know, think about these great ideas and then they don't, they don't uh, invite the community to be part of it. And then there's this disconnect. The more, the more you get people to participate in what you're doing, especially if you're doing something for the community, the more that you get people to come and participate and be part of the design process, then you have automatically buy-in. And, and 
you know, the process is going to be a lot easier. Um, so with ideas, you, you know, come up with an idea, you test it, uh, you talk to people, get feedback, you go back and, and do the same. As long, you know, it's going to take a long process. Sometimes you have to go back and define the problem again. Right, you think that you already made the, pro the progress to the second phase of design uh, problem solving, and suddenly you, ho you have to go back because you discover something that you didn't know before. So don't be afraid when you think you're almost done and then you have to go back. It, it's okay, it's, it, that is what design is about. That is the process. You're, uh, you are unveiling information that you don't know. And then the last, um, the last phase after you have done this process again and again and again of ideation, you have implementation. That is really about, you know, taking your ideas that, that became a project, taking it to the market or making it available for people to use. So you're going to be building and you're going to be testing materials or processes. And sometimes you have to go back and forth from idea to, to implementation. And, um, you know, this process, as I said, is not linear, but it's also something that um, you get better um, while you're doing it. Uh, I think that sometimes, you know, a project is done and you have to go back. I mean, don't feel like uh, you're failing if you have to go back and fix something. Because how things are today, things change every single day in technology, in how people see things and how people interact and how people share information. So a lot of times you're going to have to go back and fix something and, and go back and talk to people and bring a, or, um, or in, include a new service or include a new way of interacting with the product that you're creating. And it doesn't matter if it's an app or if it's a website or if it's a service uh, or if it's a physical product. All these, um, all these products of design go through the same um, process. And I think that I'm going to stop there. <laughs> so, yeah, so thank you very much. I'm going to be here until 1 and happy to talk to anyone. Hi, everyone. How are you all doing? Good. <laughs> so I will try to go very quickly. I know uh, we've been hearing some incredible uh, stories. Um, but really quick, I just wanted to uh, ask a quick question. Um, how many of all are you all participating in the hackathon this weekend? Or who all? I know you're here for the boot camp. But awesome. Great. OK, cool. Yay! Very excited. Were you going to? Exactly. Yes, all of, all of you participating on live stream. Uh, my name is Jennifer Lopez, and I am the founder and CEO of Wisen & Co. Uh, we're an, inter an international consulting firm uh, focusing on areas of philanthropy, uh, social impact, and innovation, and we build strategic partnerships with uh, corporations, government, uh, nonprofit organizations, NGOs, et cetera, s startups. Um, and my, um, my background is actually uh, quite interesting. I haven't really had a linear uh, path in terms of my career. Um, I would also say, while I've you know, been working on my, or running my company, one incredible project that I, I did recently was uh, head uh, the education program for 3D printing company MakerBot. And I was running their, um, uh, or it was called MakerBot Academy. And the goal of that was to, uh, to put uh, 3D printing in every K through 12 school in the United States. Uh, so that was really exciting and, and you know, fulfilling my, my love for additive manufacturing and, uh, and 3D printing. I've been following that for many years. Uh, so as I was saying, my, my path hasn't exactly been uh, very linear. I first started in uh, science and technology um, and loving technology at a very young age. Um, I actually brought something to show you guys because I wanted to, to give you a sense of you know, where I initially came from uh, when with my love for, for space exploration as well. Uh, so my version of, of hackathons that we participated in was like the sleepovers where 
uh, you would all gather together, you're part of an organization, or you would you know, participate in some science, uh, science fair project, and, and get pizza, and you know, gather together in, in a gym or in, in a, at school, and, and try to solve problems, and try to come up with ideas to, uh, to revolutionize um, you know, particular areas uh, in science or technology. So I was just gonna show you really quick, uh, this was one of the things that I wore to my version of the hackathon, which is um, this, the elementary school that I went to. And uh, so I was in the Young Astronauts Club, um, and, and actually our school, uh, which was called Scobie Elementary, it was named after one of the uh, astronauts that unfortunately uh, died in the, the Challenger crash. Uh, so our whole school was branded NASA, and you know we were always taught from a very young age to to reach for the stars and uh, you know look at um, uh, exploring and using space to to explore in, in other areas if it's science or technology or uh, even history, English, etc. So I just wanted to show you guys that because I thought that that was uh, really cool to see. You know that's. Yes, exactly, <laughs> where I started from. Um, and, and then, you know, coming from, uh, or starting in, in science and technology, I, I ended up going into molecular biology and, and thinking that I was gonna go into research and uh, worked in a lab for four years, um, and then moved on to, to media, completely pivoted out of, out of science and research. As I was thinking I was gonna get my PhD, went into uh, to media uh, and digital and, and tech, and, and then, went back into to philanthropy running my business. So, um, uh, you know, I think it's, it's interesting, you know, one of the things that, as I've been hearing, in, in terms of the themes of um, uh, these incredible stories, is, you know, bringing diverse groups of people together to really try to tackle a problem or to solve an issue. Um, and I think that that's what's really exciting, what we're gonna see this weekend. Um, and hopefully, you know, get to see some incredible ideas coming out of the, out of the hackathon. Um, so one other thing I wanted to, uh, to mention um, in, in regards to problem solving from, uh, just to get a little um, uh, silly with, with my favorite physicist, uh, Albert Einstein. Uh, he, one of his quotes that he, that he said that I thought that was really uh, pertinent for the discussion today was if he had a problem that he had to solve, he had, if he had an hour uh, to solve a problem, that he would spend 55 minutes uh, defining what the problem is and then five minutes on the solution. Um, and so, you know, I remember that Jessica was mentioning that too uh, when she was talking about her story, um, that that's a huge piece of, of what you all need to focus on and, and remembering that as you're going through the weekend um, and, and beyond is to, to really try to define the problem, um, you know, frame it correctly, ask questions, get as much information as possible, get as much, you know, that's why data is also so important. Um, and you're bringing together such diverse groups of people uh, to come up with incredible an incredible solution or hopefully an innovative um, uh, solution to, to a problem. So uh, I'll, I'll leave you with that. I'm, I told you it was gonna be very quick and I hopefully, I don't know if we have a couple minutes or a few minutes for um, hey, uh, some Q&A. Sure. <laughs> 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 uh, so yeah, that's pretty much what I wanted to, I just wanted to uh, breeze through my, my background. And then I was also gonna say one other quick thing before I, before I finish. Um, in terms of problem solving, and uh, to always look at the bigger picture. Uh, always take a step back and look at what you're doing and see how that can solve you know, problems. If it's, you know, I, I think the and in terms of anything that could benefit Earth or with space exploration or health, uh, you know, life sciences, I think, uh, if you take a step back, you know, and, and when you're involved and you, I know it's gonna be super intense um, and you're, you know, in the trenches, you know, going through um, uh, the 24 to 48, hour, 48 hours, but I think that that's the, the main, the, one of the key takeaways to remember. Thank you guys, looking forward to seeing what you all come up with. So I believe we have time for one question. And while you're thinking about your question, I did want to introduce Gladys Henderson. Stand up, Gladys, who just got here. She's also from NASA. And so she is in charge of the Challenges and Prizes program at NASA. And um, I think even tomorrow she's gonna talk about the NASA Solve website. So if you're looking for what challenges NASA has beyond like Space Apps challenges, challenge some challenge with money, um, the NASA Solve website is there and Gladys is the guru for that. So you guys just 
take, take her down for the rest of the day. You can come and ask questions. Um, one question, burning question. No, we have one. No, first hand up. Come on down. We have a um, microphone. For a live stream, we need to microphone it. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Tiffany Lindzan, and um, I would actually love some uh, suggestions. I'm part of a challenge where, in a field where not too many people are familiar with, um, and it's very dominated by uh, men. Um, I'm dealing with natural language processing. Uh, what are some suggestions for a young black woman who is um, part of a challenge where not too many people are familiar with um, would help me convince uh, an audience that my idea is a sufficient one or a successful one. Microphone that you can pass around, or are you going to grab? Okay. I just want to say really quickly um, I go through the same thing, right? And so I have mentors who have helped me through this. And the key thing is not to see um, your difference as something that's negative. It's really something positive. Like this is something that makes you unique and you need to use it as a personal asset. So because you are a black woman, you have experienced things that other people you are working with have not. Use that to your advantage. You are an expert when it comes to your personal experiences and solving problems for other black women. So just use that to empower yourself and to be a leader for other people to you know, really uh, be influenced by your vision, okay? Thank you. I was just gonna say, you know, coming from uh, science when I used to work in the lab, um, in addition to tech, uh, I've gone through exactly that, uh, trying to convince uh, my colleagues, uh, especially in a, in a male-dominated environment, uh, you know, th to substantiate your uh, your ideas or your um, solutions for something, and when you're presenting an idea, th to add on to what she was saying, you are in there. You are important. Your ideas are just as important as anybody else in that room, and and that is one thing that I've learned over the years. Um, you know, personally, in my career that it, it's it's it is intimidating, and you go in there, and it's a sea of of you know if it's a sea of guys in the room and, and you're one of the few females, and especially as a minority, you know, I resonate with that as well. Um, but I've learned, you know what, that, that you can, you rise, you keep rising above that, and if you keep showing that you have just as much say and importance and, and a place in, in that room, there, all that's gonna go away. And it's, it's gonna, you just keep charging through. So I think, you know, just to add what she was saying, you have to have that confidence and know that, that your ideas are just as important as theirs. Thank you so much. I, I'm going to add to that one. I'm sorry, I got to. When you get into people telling you your ideas are crazy, um, we have a lot of experience with that. But there, um, there, I'm more subversive a little bit about it. So I think you know, creating wins, people chase after success. So a lot of times, if you can't get anyone to listen to your grand idea, make it smaller, take little bite sized chunks, find some people around you, find the yes people, because they do exist, and be one be a yes person, take the smaller chunk, do a little win, add it to another little win, to another little win, people will then all of a sudden turn around, it's like Sauron's eye, zoop! You know, it's like, there's a little hobbit over there. So I think that's, uh, sometimes you can't take on all of the sea of no's, but you can create a tiny little crack in a path that others will go in after you. So I think, you know, these are things that we can talk about together and it's actually why we're here. So we want to have a conversation with you about how we can help you guys be successful. And, and this is a really important thing. We want you to be successful and we want to use our data and our tools and we want you to create new data and tools that you know, we can then you know, ride your coattails. So um, we have a, did you want to say something, Deborah? So what Deborah said for the live stream, you may not have heard this, but she said find like-minded people. And then when you are, it's creating the community of like-minded people that you can really build on each other. And did you? 
and fake it. solution like everyone's struggling with it you can say what about this and then it's like oh I didn't hear you what about this oh I didn't hear you and then you just go do it and you show so it's like show not tell so I think really and truthfully no one knows how to do any of this and in the data world we're in we're all this is the wild wild west so it's really cool to be in on the beginning you're on the beginning of the pioneer movement for this and we want you to really be the leaders in this movement okay so man we could talk about this forever you can see we get all excited we're gonna